Well, good morning, Fellowship Church. Well, that's a little weak. Let's try again. Good morning, Fellowship Church. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. rejoice and be glad in it. To rejoice means to have joy again and again and again and again and again. And we are here to celebrate. Amen? Amen. Gloria in excelsis Deo means glory to God in the highest. And that's what we're going to do. So would you please stand and let us celebrate the gift of Jesus. And say good morning to those around you and Happy New Year.
Well, good morning again, church. I want to just draw your attention to some words in our songs this morning. This morning we hear words like glory, and we hear the word joy. So as you sing these songs this morning, I want you just to focus on what those words mean to you. What does it mean to have glory? What does it mean to show joy? Glory means to give honor and to give the highest praise. And joy, the expression of the goodness of God. How can we not have joy? Think about all the good things. Don't dwell on the bad stuff. Focus in on all the good that God has done for you and is, and is going to do for you this year. So let's give him the praise that he is due and let's honor him.
Amen. God of all creation, as we look ahead to another year, we look above to you. Your grace is enough, your mercy is new every morning, and your power is made perfect in our weakness. This year we have faced many trials, we have fought many battles, we have learned many lessons, and we have prayed many prayers. But this is our hope in life and in death. You are the God who sees. You are the God who knows. You are the God who cares. And you are the God who loves. And so we pray for courage to face our giants. We pray for grace to cover our guilt. We pray for strength 
to overcome our challenges. We pray for joy in all circumstances, and we pray for vision to see what you see. We don't know what we will face this year, but we do know this, it will never be faced alone. Good morning, and Happy New Year. How many of you watching that video saw that man toss that little kid in the air and thought, not so high, come on. You know. I could almost hear somebody yelling at me, saying, not so high. Right? Um, you know, so it's the beginning of a new year. And we were kind of joking around as a band this morning before we were preparing and saying, well, you know, we're having just the one service this morning, obviously. And you know, somebody will come walking in about 11 o'clock and wonder why you're leaving or something like that. But you know, we talked about these. So you know, how many people will be here? What, what are we expecting? We said, well, probably all the folks who weren't out partying last night or something like that. So that says something about you, right? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I, I'm not a big New Year's celebration kind of person. My wife and I never really have been. But whenever we get to January 1st, I am always thinking a little bit. Like the, okay, so, so God, now I, now I can see 2022 in the rearview mirror. I understand things now that I didn't understand when they were happening. Or at least I see your hand in some things now that I certainly couldn't see at the time. And as we start 2023 together, I just wonder what we'll be thinking of 365 days from now when we get to the end of the year and we'll be thinking, well, we didn't see that coming this year or we didn't expect that that would take place during this calendar year and then we're looking back at it and saying, but God, you were still there and you were still present. And I don't know what your mountaintops will look like this year. And I sure don't know what your valleys will look like this year. But like that verse said on the screen a moment ago, we just know that whatever we face this coming year, we're not going to face it alone, right? We just know that whatever we... I know you were up late last night. Just stick with me a second, okay? But it was a good game. No, it wasn't. Um, um, and we won't talk about that anymore now, will we? Okay. Whatever we face this coming year, we know that we won't face it alone, right? Because we have our God who has said, I will be with you always. And we have our body of Christ who also says, I will be with you always. That carry each other's burdens. The body of Christ, the chorus of witnesses and all of that. There's a verse I want to share with you. It comes out of a book in the Old Testament of the Bible. It's a book called Lamentations. It's probably not a book that too many people read all that often for their devotions because it's literally a cry against God for some very difficult times somebody was facing. But you know this verse, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. I like that thought a lot, that we're not swallowed up or consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning, 365 days a year. And God, great is your faithfulness. We were joking a little bit before the service as well about some people choosing a word for the year or choosing a verse for the year. And, and if you do that, that's great. But, but just know that for me, every year, I just choose the same verse. And you're looking at it right now, which is the, well, Lord, I don't know what's coming. And I don't know what's going to happen in the lives of the people whom I love. But I do know that you're a faithful God and that you don't let us down. And that you're the God who's always with us. And you don't always prevent us from falling down and skinning our knees. But you are the God who picks us up again. And you are the God who is with us always. That's a great word, always. With that in mind, will you pray with me, please? Let's pray. 
God, thank you for being an always kind of God, that you're the God who has promised to be with us always, and that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to this earth, and, and we just celebrated that with Christmas and, and the birth of Jesus, and, and um, God, that's always such a wonderful time of the year, but you sent your son into this world to be flesh and blood so that we would know that you're not simply off at a distance. You're not the distance kind of God. That's not the way you work. You're the God who says, I could never be at a distance from you. My desire is to be Emmanuel instead, God with us. And that doesn't simply mean God when we're in our good days or God when all the stars are lined up and God when things are going so well and all the relationships in our life. That's not who you are. You're the God who says, I will be with you always on your best days and on your worst days. Father, I just know that with the size of our church family here and our friends who couldn't be with us this morning, there are some folks in our church family who will have a really good 2023. And maybe some things that they've been wishing for for a while or some things they've been working on, it'll come to fruition. They'll accomplish some things and achieve some things. And 365 days from now, they'll look back and say, that was a great year. But Father, I know, just based on the numbers, that there are people sitting in chairs here right now who are going to have some challenges in 2023. Those challenges could involve a relationship that somehow became something they never thought it would become. And there's hurts there and brokenness there. It could involve a phone call from the doctor with news they weren't expecting. It could involve some kind of interaction with employment. It could involve some sort of accident. Father, we don't know, wouldn't wish it on anyone. But Father, for some of us, 2023 is going to be a great year. And for others of us, it'll be the year we want to forget and the year we want to get behind us. We just know that you, O oh God, you don't change. No matter what happens this coming year, no matter what we face, victories, challenges, whatever they might look like, you are the God who is always faithful, and we even get to say, great is your faithfulness. So thanks for being a faithful God. Thanks for being a loving God. Thanks for reconciling us back to yourself through Jesus so that we wouldn't be lost and we wouldn't be wandering. Thank you for drawing us to yourself, and thank you, O oh God. That you are always accepting, always affirming, and unconditionally loving. That's who you are. It's at the core of your heart. So thanks for being that for us. We pray over our church family. For any who have had a difficult 2022, we are praying for healing, whatever that needs to look like, physically, emotionally, relationally, even spiritually. We pray, Father, for people we know who may be estranged from you in some capacity right now. We pray that you would draw them back. We pray, oh God, for people who are struggling just believing in you and believing that you are who you say you are. Father, may you give them insights and may you give them faith. We wouldn't have faith if you hadn't given it to us, oh God, so we're grateful for that as well. We pray that as we finished up 2022 as a church and we would have looked back, Father, and said, that was a good year of ministry. Well, thank you, oh God. We pray that in 2023, oh Lord, you would do even more, not to make us busier, oh God, but just to make us more effective. Our desire is to impact the community that we live in with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the presence of Christ through us. That's our prayer, oh God. And we pray that 2023 would be an even better year than last year. Because God, we, we want to devote all the harvest over to you, every changed life, every impacted heart, whatever it looks like, we devote it all to you and we pray that 2023 would be a great year for fellowship. That's always our prayer. We pray for other churches, oh God, in town and pray the exact same thing for them. May they have a great year, great day today as well. We're so grateful that you love us. We pray for all the things that you allow us to do and, and pray that you'd place your heart upon our heart and your mind upon our mind. And we pray that as we spend time in your word this morning that you'd speak to us so clearly that none of us would miss what you have to say to us. And God, as we spend some time talking about an event and an occurrence in the life of Jesus Christ, the things he said, the things he did, and the people's lives who were changed, not 
not just then, but changed for years to come. God, we pray that we could find ourselves in that story there somewhere as well. And that you would do the same things through us. You're the God who doesn't change. You're the God who's always faithful. You're the God who loves us unconditionally. And we are so grateful for you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, we're going to read a story this morning from the New Testament. It comes from one of the Gospels, one of the stories of Jesus. It's a story that comes out of Matthew. I'm sorry, it's a story that comes out of Mark. You can stand if you'd like. That's one of the things that we do here. That's entirely up to you. Mark chapter 5. When I said Matthew and the screen probably said Mark, somebody thought, whoa, it was a long night, wasn't it, Pastor, huh? No, no. All right. It's Mark chapter 5. It begins like this. It says they, and that means the disciples, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs who li- to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Wow. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. What in the world did he have to believe about God that he thought Jesus would come and torture him? Wow. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again uh, not to send them out of the area. A large crowd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission. It's interesting that Jesus gives them permission. And the evil spirits came, came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, that's a big operation, by the way, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. They're not going to take their word for it, right? When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legions of demons sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis, talk about that in a minute, how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. It's a good story. Friends, these are our Bibles. This is God's Word which has been given to us and gifted to us as always. May God's word be alive in this place and in every heart today as well. Amen. Please be seated. How about if we start out with a geography lesson? Somebody say, yay, geography. What a great way to start the year. I sense your enthusiasm. This story won't make a lot of sense if we don't look at a couple of maps first. So I want to show you a map of a part of the Middle East. This is what we call the nation of Israel. All right, I borrowed this map. Uh, off to the far left, that would be the Mediterranean. Um, if you look towards the top, way up in the top, you can see a small little lake up there. That's up where Mount Hermon is. Then farther down is what they call the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee. Jordan River runs all the way down into this funny-shaped body of water at the bottom. That's called the Dead Sea, and it's called the Dead Sea because nothing lives in there. Barely organisms. There's a lot of salt that washes into there, so the salt content's really high. If you look to the left of that a little bit, you see Judea, and then a little higher is Samaria, and then all the way up towards the top is Galilee. Even if you can't see the words on the map, you'll have to trust me with that one. Jesus spent a lot of his time up in the Galilee, so we'll look at that in a second. But if you kind of look off towards the right-hand side of the map, today that would be like um, Lebanon and Syria and Jordan, and all the way around the bottom would be Egypt. So now we'll look at uh, Galilee a little bit closer up here. Um, 
You see some cities there. There's a city called Capernaum, if you can see that. Jesus spent a lot of time there, kind of his home away from home. There's Tiberias, Cana, wedding feast there. Nazareth, that was Jesus' hometown. Bethsaida is kind of on the top, off to the, off to the right-hand side a little bit. That area off to the upper right today would be called the Golan Heights. Have you heard of that before? Six-day war, 1967, Israel, Syria, all that kind of stuff. But here's what we know about Jesus' ministry. From that Sea of Galilee, Jesus spent about 75% of his teaching time right up in that area. But it was always on the west side. Now, if, if you're directionally challenged, that's this side over here, right? Okay. So on the left-hand side, the west side of that Sea of Galilee, those cities there, Jesus spent a lot of time there. And um, some of his most famous teachings took place in that area, like the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard of that before. Some of Jesus' most famous healings and miracles in that area as well. It's because that area had a lot of people who were believers. We know that because digging through the remains of those cities, archaeological expeditions, they find a lot of synagogues. And people who study these kinds of things know that when they find churches and synagogues, there obviously was a lot of religion and faith there. So Jesus spent a lot of time on that west side of the Sea of Galilee. But there's only a couple of times when he went to the east side. You think, well, Pastor Mike, does that mean that Jesus just favored western people over eastern people? No. It's because on the west side, the left side, where you see those cities like Capernaum and Cana and Nazareth, There were a lot of people of faith there, and Jesus spent a lot of time with them. But on the other side, that eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, that was a place where what they called in their day the pagans lived, meaning the unbelievers. That was kind of uncharted territory out there. There were people there who had some pretty strange practices and people involved in a lot of religions for which today we would say, well, that that just sounds really wrong. And some of their faith practices, we won't get into them today because some of it's the kind of stuff we shouldn't be talking about with kids in a room, right? But that's the kind of stuff that people were involved in on that side of the lake. So Jesus spent a lot of time on this side of the lake. In fact, the other side of the lake, they had a couple of names for it. First of all, they called it the other side, which isn't all that imaginative, right? I mean, you'd think they'd come up with a better name than that. But sometimes they just called it the other side of the lake as if to say to your kids, Don't go to the other side. We stay on this side. They also called it the Decapolis. That's kind of a big fancy name. Decapolis simply means ten cities. Deca means ten. Polis, from which we get our word politics. Polis means city. So the Decapolis was the area that was called ten cities. This is a really, really easy question to start your year. How many major cities were in the area called the Decapolis? No, there were only eight. I'm kidding you. No. (laughs) There were ten large cities in that area. And each city had kind of its own little county and so on. So they called it the area of the Decapolis. Here's something else just for fun this morning. They found the world's oldest hippodrome in that area. A hippodrome is a place where they raced horses. Hippos is the word for horse. Drome means to race. Um, it's um, It's like the word hippopotamus, right? Hippopotamus means river horse, river potamus, hippos, horse. So a hippodrome is a place where they raced horses. So we know that on that side of the lake, they did a lot of horse racing, and they even found some money-changing stations in that area, so they know that people were betting on horse races a long time ago, right? Not anything we invented. But for Jesus and his disciples, they all stayed on this side of the lake. They didn't travel to that side of the lake very often. Because there were people over there who believed some different things and did some different things, and it just wasn't an area where they traveled very often. Except for a day when Jesus wanted to teach his disciples something that he couldn't teach them any other way. So let me take you back into the scripture passage. I want to show you something this morning. This is back in Mark chapter 4. So this is before what we read. It says, that day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to, you say it, The other side, which isn't very descriptive, right? Unless you're listening like his disciples are listening and saying, oh, the other side, in quotes, I know exactly where that is. We're going to the other side of the lake. And my mom told me never to go there. Remember, the disciples are all young, right? Because I've heard things about that place over there, and I've learned some things about it. I'm not supposed to be over there, Jesus. 
But when Jesus says we're going over to the other side, the disciples all find themselves in the boat. Now, if you know anything about the story that came before this one, and we didn't read it, they no more than push that boat off, and they're going to travel across that Sea of Galilee. And it doesn't take very often before, but very long before, what happens? A storm comes up, and it's a bad storm. It's the kind of storm that's swamping the boat, and the boat wasn't real big in those days. So you've got 13 people, 12 disciples and Jesus, inside that boat, and the waves are crashing over the boat, and the disciples have got to be thinking, I knew this was a bad idea. I knew what would happen if I went to the other side, because mom told me that's a bad place to go. I'll bet the disciples were all sitting in the boat writing out their obituaries or something, you know, thinking of that nice plaque they'll have on the shore. Those boys went to the other side and none of them made it back type of thing. Well, Jesus calms the wind, if you remember that story at all. Jesus, by supernatural power, proving again that he's God, he calms the storm down. They all make it to the other side. And I'm sure the disciples jump out of the boat and start kissing the ground, right? That's exactly what I would do. I'd be, thank you, O oh God, for saving me from that storm, and I'm so grateful to be on land again, until they're met by the welcoming committee. Now, they didn't have welcome wagon back then, but they no more than get out of the boat, and they're met by a one-man welcoming committee. They find a man who comes down towards the beach at them, and he is screaming at them. And he's yelling things that they don't understand. Now, at that point in time, the disciples had a choice. They can either confront the man or they can get back in the boat, right? And they're probably thinking, I don't like either one of my options this morning. But the man doesn't seem all that interested in them. He heads straight for Jesus. He's not interested in talking to the 12 disciples. He wants to talk straight to Jesus, almost like, almost like he knew who Jesus was even though he'd never seen him before in his life. Now, you know from the story that we used a couple of words to describe this man. There was a passage in the verse that said that um, the man had an evil spirit. And there was another passage that said that he was possessed by demons. And I'll bet that you're thinking, boy, Pastor Mike, I sure am glad we don't have those things anymore today, Right? right? But, but can you really say no that quick? Really? Can you really, looking at the world that we live in, say, I sure am glad that we no longer have evil spirits or demons that might possess people in any way, shape, or form? Well, I guess it depends on how you define evil spirits and how you think in terms of demonic possession. You didn't think we'd be discussing that on January 1st, did you? I don't know what I believe about evil spirits and demonic possession. People ask me questions sometimes, Pastor Mike, do you still believe that people can be possessed by demons and so on? I say, you know, I just don't know. You know, God has never made that all that clear to me. Here's what I know. I've spent a lot of time with people who struggle with some really awful things for which we just can't explain it. I've met with some people for whom a psychological diagnosis just doesn't do justice to their situation in life, and they hurt with the kinds of things that I can't define, and apparently neither can anybody else. So there certainly have been times in my life when I've spent time with some people who are in really severe pain, for which I'd say, okay, God, is this like evil spirit-ish demon possession stuff? I don't know. You make it clear to me what's going on here. All I know is they're in pain, and nobody seems to know what to do. So if you ask me, Pastor Mike, do we still believe in things like evil spirits and demonic possessions? I'd say, well, I really don't want to believe in those things, but sometimes I just don't have a better solution. How does that sound to you? Maybe you have more insights into that than I do, but I certainly have seen situations where I'd look at somebody and say, I don't get this one, oh God. And other than evil spirits in big quotes, I don't know what else to say. Here's what I know about that man, though, 2,000 years ago. His life was miserable. I don't know that he'd ever seen a therapist or anybody who had honestly diagnosed him as being demon-possessed or you have an evil spirit, take two and call me in the morning. What I know is, at some point in time, the people in town, they kicked him out of town. 
Why else would he be living out there? The cliffs leading off from the beach are filled with like some caves that just kind of naturally eroded over time. And they were using some of those caves as like burial ground for people back in those days. So it's most likely that man was probably living in one of the caves. And there were people in town who probably said that's where he belongs, out with the dead stuff. Because it looks like something's dead inside of him and we can't diagnose it either. And at some point in time they had tried to, I don't know, bind him and somehow he broke it. His life is miserable. And it says that he used to cut himself with stones. Today we'd probably say he was suicidal. I don't have a better word for that. His life was awful. And there were people in town who probably thought, I don't know that his life is worth living, but we don't feel called to take it from him, so we'll just expel him as far away as we can get him. And so when Jesus and the boys land on the beach there, and they all jump out of the boat, and the disciples are so happy to be on land again, they see that man coming back to, coming to them, and they're thinking, boat or man, boat or man. It's a toss of the coin, honestly. And he's screaming and yelling stuff. And this is something that he actually yelled at Jesus. Uh, back up a second there, if you will. The second part of that one. Yeah. Um, the, the disciples see that Jesus is, is calming this man down, and the disciples even come up and say, who is this? Even the wind and the waves are obeying him. They're, they're not quite sure what to make of all this. Now you can jump to that next verse if you don't mind. It says, when the man saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? How in the world would a man who's demon-possessed, if we can use that phrase, and living with evil spirits, how in the world could he walk up to Jesus and say, um, I know exactly who you are. You're the son of the most high God. In light of the fact that the disciples who just got out of the boat and have already spent at least a year with the Jesus, they're the ones who were saying, who is this? The wind and the waves obey him. We still haven't figured out who he is. The demon-possessed man comes up to Jesus and says, I know exactly who you are. You're the son of the most high God. Which is pretty cool. Somehow this person who was in immense pain, had greater insights into who Jesus was than the disciples who lived with him 24-7, 365. When we all get to heaven, I can't wait to ask God about that one as well. Like, God, why didn't you give the disciples the same insight that you gave this guy? But, But there it is. Jesus heals him. He casts the demons out, however that worked. I'd love to know why Jesus didn't say to all those demons, evil spirits, whatever it's inhabiting that poor guy, I'd love to know why Jesus didn't say, just go off into a wasteland someplace and make yourself at home there. Instead, Jesus sees a herd of pigs, which are unclean animals to Jews, but very tasty to all of us, right? Right? Okay, thank God for bacon. Jesus looks at this herd of pigs and sends the legion of demons into them. Some scholarly people have said, well, that makes perfectly good sense. The pigs were unclean animals. I don't know what's all about that. I just know that Jesus said the demons will go there. The pigs rush down into the water. 2,000 of them all drown. The people who are tending the pigs, they go into the city. They bring back an entourage, probably city leaders, who all immediately start begging Jesus to just leave If you were in that crowd that day, wouldn't you at the very least walk up to Jesus and say, hey, um, how'd you do that? Because, like, we've been living with this guy for a long, long time, and we've never been able to set him free or anything. Here the man now sits, clothed in his right mind. He's rational. He's responsible. How'd you do that, Jesus? And since you did it, who exactly are you again? Don't you think they'd start asking some questions or something like that? But they didn't. They just begged Jesus to leave. So he did. He and the disciples get back in the boat. The man whom he had healed, who actually has a chance at life now. I mean, I don't know what his life was like when he was demon-possessed, evil spirit, living by himself, suicidal, out there in the tombs. I just know that now, maybe for the first time in his life, he feels like his life has value. So he says to Jesus, can I go with you? Can I be disciple number 13? I promise to be good. I won't scare the boys. The disciples, meanwhile, are thinking, let him have that end of the boat or something like that, right? 
But he just wants to go with Jesus. I mean, he feels like this sense of debt to him. I want you to see what Jesus says to him. He said, no, I want you to go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. So get this. The man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis. What's that word mean again? Ten cities. You got it. Began to tell in the ten cities area how much Jesus had done for him. So the man could have gone with Jesus. And Jesus could have made him disciple number 13. And they probably would have had some kind of great ministry together. And the rest of the disciples could have pointed at that guy and says, boy, you should have seen who we used to be before Jesus came into his life and changed him forever. They would have made a great story. But Jesus had something else in mind. And he has the same thing in mind for you. He takes the man and sends him back to where he came from. Not just the city where he came from, but all the cities of that area. Ten cities, Decapolis, the other side. And he says, I want to set you loose on that area. Probably a whole lot of people out there who've heard your story. I want to send you back there. And I want you to tell them what happened today. I want you to tell them how much I did for you. And he did. I'll show you that in a minute. But he did. So this man becomes, literally, the first evangelist on the other side. So you're thinking, well, Pastor Mike, where where did he get his biblical knowledge? I don't know. Did he go to seminary? I don't think so. College? Nope. I'm not even sure if he could read or write. Well, how did he work out all of his theology then? I don't know. Did he write a book? I don't know. How about a Billy Graham-style crusade? No idea. Form a band? I don't know. I have no idea what he did after that day. But here's what I know. We've been reading out of Mark 5, right? I want to show you Mark 6. It says, when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. That's one of the other cities of the Decapolis and anchored there. As soon as they, Jesus and the disciples, got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus and all who touched him were healed. Hey, how did those people recognize Jesus? Because I've read through the Gospels, he never had been to Gennesaret before. This is the first time he's ever been to that city. Gennesaret is a city that's not far off the water. It's in the Decapolis area. It's down towards the south. Jesus never went to Gennesaret. So so how'd they know who he was? Well, somebody did exactly what he was supposed to do. I can't say this exactly for sure, but it sure seems to line up. I can connect the dots out of a pretty simple mind. Jesus heals one man. He travels from one side of the Galilee all the way to the other side of the the Galilee, puts all the disciples' lives at risk, so they thought. He heals one man. He wasn't on the shore for more than half an hour. I mean, how long could that have taken? When the man is healed and in his right mind, Jesus sends him off on a mission trip. Jesus and the disciples get back in the boat and sail the seven miles all the way back to the other side of the lake. I'd say, wow, that's 14 miles. That's a lot of sailing. And you scared the bejeebers out of the disciples doing it. He did that to change one life. Don't you ever doubt that Jesus will go to great lengths and great means to change one life. Maybe even yours. Maybe even somebody whom you know and love. Maybe somebody of whom other people would say, that one's too far gone. Because I guarantee you the townspeople gave up on that guy a long time ago. But as soon as Jesus landed, he knew exactly who he was looking for. And that's the life he changed. So lesson number one is, Jesus would go to all kinds of great lengths to change one life. I wonder if the disciples, when they got back to the other side of the Galilee, were thinking, hey, you know, that was quite the experience. Thought I was going to die, but it was worth it. One life. But then notice what Jesus did with that one life. Jesus said, you know these people. You're familiar with the other side. You've probably visited the Decapolis at some point in time in your life. I want you to go to those people, go back home, go to those people and tell them what happened to you. How he did it, I don't know. Here's what I do know. Probably six, seven, eight months later, 
Jesus lands on the other side again, and there are people coming out saying, hey, um, you're that Jesus guy, right? We, we know something about you. I look at that story today and say, well, that kind of looks like the world's first mission trip. And you started with somebody who was really bro- broken and wounded and busted up, right, God? That's how you work. He changed one life, went to great means to change one life, and then took that one life, and rather than say, oh yeah, come on, we'll find you a nice recliner here, just come with us. No, Jesus said, you're exactly the man I'm looking for to go back to that area and change another life. And that life will change another life. And that life will change another life. I want to set you back to that land you just came from and start changing lives. And he did. Because if he didn't, how would it be possible for people in Gennesaret, where Jesus had never visited before, how would it be possible for people to meet him down on the shore and go, you're Jesus, we know you, we know things about you. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. He was Billy Graham before there was a Billy Graham. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. So here's the second lesson. I wonder where the other side is for you. I wonder where your Decapolis is. I wonder where God's going to take you in 2023 because you've got 365 new days coming ahead of you, I hope. I wonder where your life will take you this year. I wonder who you're going to bump into this year. I wonder which acquaintance you'll renew. You know, somebody you knew a while back, kind of lost track of them, and you met them again. I wonder what kind of conversations you're going to have with people this year that might be, in any sense of the word, redemptive. I wonder who's going to be in your circle this year. Just the people you spend time with. Could be young, could be old. Could be people you've known before, could be somebody you meet for the first time. Here's what I know. At some point in time this year, you're going to spend some time on the other side. You will spend time this year on the other side. You're going to spend time with some people who perhaps don't live exactly the way you live or don't believe exactly the things that you believe. If you only spend all of your time with Christian people, you need to enlarge your circle, okay? You need to spend time with people who are other side kind of people. You need to spend time with people who are Decapolis kind of people, who maybe their lifestyle and their beliefs aren't exactly what we would normally adhere to, but that's exactly how God makes converts. And wouldn't it be something? If because God has changed your life. Wouldn't it be something if God gives you a chance to spend some time with somebody this year and maybe even influence their life in a way that causes them to say, I know who Jesus is now. Wouldn't that make a great year? Because here's what I know about God. And you see this in the heart of Jesus. He'll go to great lengths to change one life. But the second thing I know about God is that God always wants to take that one life and send that one life someplace so that that one life now becomes two and three and four and five and six and ten. So I wonder whom God is already putting in your life at the beginning of this year because you're going to have a lot of chances this coming year to let some things rub off from you onto somebody else. Wouldn't it be something? If at the end of 2023, we all get together and start telling our Decapolis stories. Man, Pastor Mike, you wouldn't believe the person I spent time with this year, and guess what? I see a positive spiritual change in their life. Hallelujah. Wouldn't that be something? I promise I won't sing if you do it, okay? If you don't do it, I'm going to sing, just so you know. Okay. That's incentive. But wouldn't it be something if God gave each and every one of us One opportunity this year to have some kind of a positive spiritual influence on somebody who's currently living on the other side in the Decapolis and somehow the change in our life becomes change in somebody else's life as well. Wouldn't that be something? All it takes is one changed life. Wouldn't it be something if that was you this coming year? Will you pray with me, please? God, that all sounds and feels kind of intimidating. It just is. Because 
we're here this morning. You, you've already had some influence, effect upon our life, maybe changed us for all eternity. And God, we'd like to think that, well, now we can just kind of settle in and get comfortable with some things and, and live a certain way. But God, sometimes we forget that your preferred method for changing the world is that one changed life would change another. And that one would change another. And that one would change another. It's how you've been working for 2,000 years and it's still your desire today. God, may you change these lives first and then send us out into the world to our own other side Decapolis-ish place. Give us a chance. Just give us one chance. God, on behalf of these people, I know they can do it. Give every one of us at least one chance this coming year. Spend some time with a Decapolis person. And maybe, just maybe, the life of Christ that's in us will rub off on them. And one changed life becomes two. And we don't have to look too far living where we live to find the other side, oh God. It's all around us. May Fellowship Church exist. Be the kind of church where a couple hundred changed lives becomes a couple hundred more. That's our prayer. We are grateful to you, O oh God. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. When Pastor started the sermon, he, would, he showed us that map and showed us the Dead Sea. And it, it's been sticking with me the whole time you were preaching. The Dead Sea is dead because things come into it, but nothing goes out of it. Let's think about that for just a minute. Are we like that? We let the word of God flow into us, but do we let it flow out of us? With every word we speak and every action that we make, is it Jesus? So as we sing this next song about the beautiful, powerful, and wonderful name of Jesus, maybe that's your word for this year. Would you please stand and let us declare him today?
The name of Jesus is powerful. It can heal the broken, it can raise the dead, and it can bring victory where we thought there was only defeat. Jesus is the name above every other name. the name of Jesus. We're simply saying that he has power in our life. They use the word name to describe a person's character. So when we say that Jesus has a beautiful name, what we're saying is he has such a beautiful heart and he has a beautiful heart for you. As you start this year without knowing what's coming, may you know for sure that Jesus has a beautiful heart and he has that heart for you this coming year. If you're a guest this morning, there are some gift bags in the back in the coffee area. Please make sure you take one with you. We're really glad to have you here today. If you'd like somebody to pray over you this morning, maybe 2022 hasn't ended so well. or Maybe there's concerns about 23. You can come to the front. Some folks would love to pray over you. We're just glad to have you here this morning, friends. Welcome to the new year. And as you leave this place today, may you take with you God's grace and his mercy and his peace. May it be poured out upon you in abundance this year. Go in peace.